In literature, there are only two possible plot lines, and you know them, right? The first one is, someone goes on a journey. And the only other plot is a stranger comes to town. <laughs> In these paradigms, concepts of strangeness, an outside perspective, and encounters with the unknown lead to great revelations. So what happened when the stranger came to town about 10 years ago? Quite a lot. I came to town three years ago in 2010 and started going around through the welcome introductions of many people to learn about what happened in that time and what we could do to be better neighbors now that we were no longer strangers. I started learning tons of anecdotes about what happened at Main Street, about how it had not been just a boarded up town, but it was a bricked up town. Individuals like the Gilvies from Hudson Beach Glass told me great stories about when they bought their building after hearing about Dia announcing to come to Beacon. I said to John Gilvey, wow, you must have gotten a great deal. And he said back to me, yeah, if we had done it before the DIA announcement, we could have got the building for a dollar. <laughs> but all of those anecdotes aside, what's the real data? The real data is collected by the Center for Creative Community Development in an over 10 year study. And I think some of you are familiar with it, but we'll just describe it quickly. This very smart group uh, is made up of an economist called Stephen Shepard and uh, a sociologist named Kay Oler. And what they do is study what happens when arts and cultural organizations move to new communities. And they have real data. So you click on the case studies, and then you go to the little button that has beacon in the name, and you get to a page that has published articles, lots of economic data. I think, uh, just like the previous TED talk we saw about people who love research and data, nobody loves data like e economists. Um, and they also have these extraordinary toolkits which are dynamic and you can use for your organizations. The first one is the regional economic impact model and it looks at four main categories. It looks at what is the operating budget of a given year, um, how many visitors are there, and how many visitors are from outside the region. You can, you can modify that yourself for your own businesses or for your own organizations. And the study shows that the result of, the, of this cultural organization being in Beacon yields about $13.2 million into the local economy. Another toolkit, which is also adaptable and dynamic, is the visitor origin map. Right now it's set up for this snapshot to look at member data which are the red dots. The colored um, fields above are actually census data on poverty levels. But there are active geocodes where you can put in um, zip codes from your own information that you may be tracking your, your customers, your visitors, uh, your member organizations that you partner with so that you can use these toolkits. But what is really the point? <laughs> The point of all of these cultural organizations, and there are so many in this region that have done so much to improve the fabric of all of our connectivity, I think the one thing that we all have in common is a central belief in the transformation, the power, the transformative power of art. And I know in my own case, um, I had those experiences very young. My mother took me to museums and galleries, and I was very lucky she brought me home with my sisters and said, let's not talk about what you saw today, show me. And she put us in front of uh, paper and pencil and paints and said, show me. And so I was taught a visual language. And I was taught a new way to think about problem solving, using line, using color, using shape. We also think about the transformative power of art to save land areas. This, this work by Robert Smithson has actually prevented oil drilling in the Great Salt Lake. Social sculpture has a great meaning as it becomes public work. This is Joseph Boyce who, of course, said everyone is an artist 
and created this work, 7,000 Oaks, planting 7,000 Oaks around the world, starting in 82 at Documenta, and then expanded by Dia on 22nd Street in Chelsea. But what about Beacon? There's a lot going on nationally that's really a tragedy. There used to be arts education in all the public schools, uh, not all, but many. Most of us grew up, if we're of a certain age, <laughs> with art class, music, uh, possibly drama, there might have been a band, there might have been an orchestra. These are things that were a part of public education in America. Uh, the arts were also a part of popular culture. And this is an important thing to remember. At night, you might see an artist, an opera singer, an avant-garde artist even, um, on, on a talk show or on a, a variety show. And we don't have that now. So this is one of the most important things that, that came to town as we were thinking about this problem. Right now, the people who believe that arts can change the world are actually mostly just talking to each other. Um, we, we, we know, <laughs> but how do we get the word out? The most important way and easiest way is start with kids. DIA's longest running program is the arts education program in the, in the city of Beacon Schools, which started in 2001 before the museum opened. This program unites seven or more teaching artists in true partnership with the City of Beacon full-time teachers to expand the school curriculum through exposure to contemporary art, which is a deeply held belief. These kids are exposed to work and methodologies that change the way that they approach their math problems and their science problems. The point is not to train them necessarily to become artists, although that would be a lovely offshoot, but rather to continue to make connections so that we can cross the line, the line of 9D, and be a very much um, a part of the community. A lot of the work is inspired sometimes by works in the collection, and then the kids work back in, this, in their studios and schoolrooms. A project that's coming up this summer for the first time that's very exciting is the Center for Urban Pedagogy is leaving New York City for the first time in its history and is going to work in Beacon with teens from uh, Dutchess County. In the city, the Center for Urban Pedagogy uses art and design to teach students about civic engagement. Because after all, the poet Shelley said, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Here in Beacon, they're going to be using video and journalism skills and training to make projects that instill confidence and public speaking skills um, that will also be a part of a portfolio as they begin to think about what they want to do for college. But the main thing that we need to think about and that we need to learn from and listen from, from all of the listening we've been doing, is this one simple word, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. One of the themes today about connecting with each other. Historically, the organization had collaborated, of course, with Scenic Hudson, with this wonderful organization, Beacon Institute for Rivers and Estuaries, who were one of the first people to welcome me when I came here. But just to cite one of the programs that's going on right now is a long, um, a two-year uh, so far program with Clearwater thinking about how do we unite our shared missions. Their mission is environmentalism through using the Hudson River as a, as a teaching tool. We think about the Hudson River Valley as a muse for arts, from the Hudson River School to the present day and the presence of a contemporary art museum on its, on its shores. We've also done projects with, that are new with uh, Garrison Institute, focusing on the contemplative nature of many of the artists in the collection and the contemplative experience of coming to the museum, it seemed a natural to work on programs with Garrison Institute. An upcoming project is working um, in a food-based sustainability program starting in July with Glenwood. But what can we really do? <laughs> We've tried all these things, we're having some nascent successes there, and we're learning a lot from the community who's teaching us. But we've heard today a bit about creative placemaking, which I think is really the next step to think outside of the box about what we could use here in Beacon. 
I went to a convening of, on community uh, creative placemaking uh, in Hartford and learned about this amazing project called iQuilt. And I don't know if you're familiar with it. But what it does is it started with a cultural organization, the, Book, the Bushnell Center, who partnered with civic authorities, the city, state, and county, that's now involved federal, but that was later, and then the business community, as well as all the other cultural assets in the community. Hartford's a bigger city than Beacon. They have 45 cultural assets, but we have many cultural assets in Beacon, and we have many organizations that would benefit from us making an absolutely clear way to connect with each other. Just one thing that I learned from this conference was this wayfinding signage project. So that everywhere in Hartford, when you're at the stop sign, you can see how many minutes is it to the Howland Cultural Center? How many minutes is it to whatever the other destination that you might be trying to find? Or it's a way of learning about these other destinations. You can also point out restaurant areas, business areas. I think that if we can figure out a way to use this as a model, we could all work together in a very effective way. Um, one point about the Wayfinding Signage project is that it was done very inexpensively for the entire city of Hartford. Uh, Santa Monica-based architect um, designed the signs, very simple graphics you can see on the left side. And the whole project was $17,000, which is not that, not that bad. And one of the things they did was only affix the signs to the back of existing signs. They, they found a number of ways to do this very cost effectively. So I think as we think about ways to connect and use the value of our cultural tourism, our developing cultural tourism, we'll make stronger connections and think about ways to attract and retain businesses that continue all the momentum that you've all described today. Thank you very much.